strategies on like a weekly basis awesome one two people three people awesome okay how about like maybe like on a monthly basis you guys might talk about I feel like the common ones are like visualization or like goal setting or you know maybe you have some cues that you help your athletes through so we're trying to do it but you guys as coaches you're doing a ton of stuff you're worrying about technique and flexibility and conditioning <laughs> 
and working through all of that with, with a lot of kids, right? And there are a lot of components to gymnastics. But our goal is to be able to come in, help you guys out, help the gymnasts out, and, and bring that mindset piece. We usually address, like I said, a strength training for the mind. So you guys understand that, that all of those components go into the sport. We've all had those gymnasts where they can practice and do amazing in practice, but they get to a meet and fall apart. Right? It's so hard to watch. And you know they work hard. They, you know they want it. You know they've put in the time, but unfortunately it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you don't qualify, you don't qualify. If you don't you know, show it when it counts, it doesn't matter. So, you know, just like you are, as a coach, you wouldn't say, hey, you know, I don't know, go condition for like 20 minutes and whatever you feel like doing. You're, you're like, no, go do this many leg lifts, this many handstand push-ups. Like you're very specific about what you want them to do. We want to take that same approach to mindset training. We wanna be consistent. We wanna be systematic. A lot of these girls come in with mental blocks and fear and they say, you know, I wanna get over this mental block. But there's more to it than that. If we get over that mental block, unfortunately, a lot of times they come back if we're not addressing some of the underlying stuff there. So we can help them through that, but we also want them to do it consistently. You don't go to practice once a month and then visualize the rest of the time. No, you do it. You do it day in and day out. You practice that way. So with this mindset kind of thing, I want you to practice using your mind in a different way. I want you to practice using these strategies so that it becomes habit, so that when competition day comes, you're good to go. Your default when you're nervous and worried, come on in, um, that your default is a better place than what it used to, used to be. So like I said, fear and mental blocks are definitely some of those areas. Fear and mental blocks do not just happen to lower level kids or anything like that. Um, before US Classic, Simone Biles tweeted out that she was having trouble, she wasn't able to go backwards all of a sudden. And if Simone Biles can come across mental blocks, then any kid could face this. Um, you know, she wouldn't go over things and, and she acknowledged, she was like, it was totally, you know, a mental thing, obviously. It's not that I couldn't do these skills, it was I'm coming back after so long and have to compete at this big meet. Um, so, what we're gonna do, first step a lot of times, when I'm working with a girl or a guy um, that is dealing with the fear, the, the first thing we wanna do is kind of acknowledge that fear, put words to it. Like, you, can, you don't have to drop the brave face, tell me what's going on. Because in reality, gymnastics is a scary sport to some extent, right? There are dangerous skills, you could get hurt. Um, you know, and giving gymnasts that credit, like, I know that if you could do this right now, you would. There's nothing fun about standing on a beam, wiggling your toes like this for 10 minutes, right? Not going through back handspring. There's nothing fun about that. I know you don't, you're not doing this for attention. And I also know that you don't know how to fix this problem. And a lot of times, as coaches, you're frustrated because you're like, I don't know whether to give them space and let them cool down. I don't know whether to like threaten them and up the consequences. Like nothing really seems to be working there. So if we can kind of work through piece by piece and add the pieces together, you know, and also encourage the girls that while fear may be a normal part of this, we almost have to accept that. You know, I've, I've had girls that um, had a, a 12 year old and she was like, I'm, I'm worried that I'm gonna Split, like split the beam or slide down the beam. I was like, well, if you That's stick with the sport, that will happen. <laughs> so let's just accept that, that like at some point in time, you will split the beam. So are you willing to accept that or not? Because we can't live in fear of something that will probably happen. Um, so the, um, I like this description up here. So I mean, it's usually reduced to fear is the feeling that you're worried you're not gonna be able to handle the outcome of the situation. So if we go to our girls and say, what's your worst fear? What are you afraid, what are you actually afraid is gonna happen? Their answer might surprise you, which we'll get into a little bit. It's not always the same fears that I might have in my head. Um, but it's, if we're able to work through that and say, okay, let's say that happens, then what? Where do we go from there? If that worst case scenario happens, how would we be able to work through it? How would we be able to, what are the next steps? And then from there, you know, we can kind of see, and usually it's 
seems less daunting if we talk through it. Um, so, you know, by facing that, like I said, realizing it's not as bad as it seems, um, asking these girls, you know, a lot of times it's not just injury. It's not just, I'm worried about getting hurt or something like that. Especially in some of the younger ones, the fear that I hear most often is like, I'm, I'm worried about feeling embarrassed. I'm worried the other girls are gonna be like, why is she this level? She shouldn't be level seven. Look at her, she can't even do that. Or they're worried that now with like social media, they're worried that maybe someone won't say something in practice or laugh at them directly, but maybe they're gonna like post a comment or do like an Instagram story later that's like so-and-so fell at practice and she looks so dumb. You know, something like that. These are very real fears for them. Whereas you or I might be like, well, whatever, it's part of the sport, but, but we have to help them through that. We have to help them realize that mistakes are a part of gymnastics. That, you know, you can't, you're never gonna go up there. If you are challenging yourself, you're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna fall. You're gonna look dumb, right? We've all fallen on our face. We've all had ridiculous things. I myself, I was at um, level 10 regionals the one year and in 30 second touch, I did my handspring layout flight. Somehow man, I slipped a foot on the handspring and landed just flat on my stomach on the beam, on the thing, in front of everybody, you know, whatever. But it was such a thing where I was like, it's part of it, right? Dumb things happen. And you have to get through that. It's not like, what did my teammates think? Did they think that, you know, something bad about me? It'd be, did they judge me? The other very real thing is letting down coaches, <laughs> letting down parents. Um, usually it's people outside of themselves. Usually I don't hear, well, I'm worried about letting myself down. It's not one that I hear very often. But the injury one, I do hear a lot. Um, and sometimes the injury one can be real. It was working with a girl, she wouldn't go for her overshoots. Um, she had injured herself twice on overshoots. I believe she forget she like dislocated an elbow the one time she came back and did it again and she managed to break her thumbs oh. so in that case you know it was kind of that real. conversation of like this happened not once but twice and now it's in your head she moved on and ended up doing shirt wax <laughs> which is funny um, so sometimes there is that legitimate fear there right so give me some examples what are some common things that you guys hear what are some skills or events in total that your gymnasts are afraid of Series on beam is a huge one, right? Flyaways is a big one. Back tumbling. Back tumbling in general, going backwards, right? Mm -hmm. Which always baffled me. I am not, like, I would rather go backwards any day than go forwards, but to each their own. Going backwards is a big one. And then it tends to get contagious, right? Where it starts with, I won't do this one skill, but there's a lot of skills in the code of points. I'll just pick that one. And then all of a sudden, I can't do that one. You know, maybe if I can't do flights on beam. <laughs> I know, you got the panel in front there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, take out your shin. Um, you know, I can't do flights on beam. And then it's, I can't, you know, do my double full on floor. Oh, I can't even do a layout on floor. Oh, I can't do a back handspring on floor. We don't want to get to that point where it just continues to get contagious. We don't want to give our gymnasts the space to pick and choose. We don't want to start to say that, like, this is a normal part of the sport, right? Our goal is that you should be going for your skills like 90, 95% of the time, barring something weird happening, right? Um, the other place it can get really contagious is with teammates. So that overshoot example, it started with the one girl. By the end of it, five girls on the team were not doing their overshoots. Now, she was the only one that didn't get it back. The other four competed it that year and were able to get it back. But it, it starts to become contagious within the gym as well. So making sure that we, we stop it there and try to catch it as early as we can and then also prevent it moving forward. This is an important note um, and something that I still have to be careful of myself. While I'm talking and trying to relate to a kid and trying to give examples and, and work with them, I have to be careful that I'm not putting new ideas in their head. That I'm not saying, well, are you afraid of this or this or this? And they'll be like, well, I wasn't, but yeah, you have a good point, right? So I don't want them to say, oh, you know, you're not doing your double back, so you're worried about falling on your head. When maybe they were just worried about, like, their teammate laughing at them. That's a lot less of a fear. That's something we can work through, right? So 
let's, we just have to be careful. I wanted to at least make note for you guys that, and it's also something that we don't want our gymnasts as much as we can sharing their fears with their teammates as well. And trying, maybe even having that conversation where how you can be a great teammate is to keep a lot of the negativity to yourself and then share some of that positive stuff. You could say, you know what, I'm worried about this too. I'm struggling with this too. But let's not, let's not compound the fear throughout the whole team. So one of the big aspects of this is helping our gymnasts gain understanding. You know, one of my first questions is like, okay, you won't go for, let's say flight series, which is a common one. Okay, you won't go for your flights. What's running through your head when you're standing there on the beam before you go, right? When, and then I'll compare that and I'll say, what's a skill that you could do in your sleep? Um, maybe it's round of hands swing layout on floor or something like really basic and simple. Um, what are you thinking about in the corner before you go? And they're like, oh, nothing, I just go. Like I don't have to think about it. I'm like, great. So our goal being you want your mind to be as quiet as possible. When you're worrying about a skill, when you're facing these mental blocks, you're, you're standing there for that flight series, you have a lot going on in your head. What if I slip a hand? What if I fall? What if I actually injure myself? What if I never get this skill and I'm gonna have to learn a new flight? What if my coach gets mad? What if I have to stay late and my mom gets mad? What if, you know, competition season's coming and I start to lose it again? Like there's a lot, you just start to spiral, right? So that process, they start to spiral, but then they, they go in there and they're like, you got it, yeah, you're good. You can do this, you know how to do it. And they start fighting back and forth with themselves. And that fighting, definitely causes that neurological fatigue, tires them out, which we're gonna get to, and makes it harder overall. Because gymnastics requires a lot of brain power. There is a lot going on. For your brain, it's not like you know walking in a line or running and kicking a soccer ball even, right? There's a lot of mechanics involved in that. But when you're doing a brown of handspring layout, the amount of things that your brain needs to tell your body to do, your finger, I mean, have you ever crunched a finger on a back handspring? down to your fingers, right? That you're thinking through each step. Trying to figure out where you are in space. Oh, I crunched my, my back handspring a little bit, now I need to adjust my layout. You know, all of those kind of things, you're relying on that muscle, me muscle memory. You're relying on your brain to tell your body what to do. I remember freaking myself out, standing there being like, I don't actually know how to twist. Like if I thought about it, how do I do a double fool? I don't. I don't know. Right, you just do it. You've done the progression. Somehow your, your brain has learned how to tell your body to do it. And it, it sticks. I, I went back after two kids, two C-sections. I was playing around in the gym. And I'm like, I'm going to do a tuck pull into the pit off of the vault. You know, it's high, it's fine, it's good, whatever. I don't, I don't know how to do a tuck pull. Like, I, I couldn't, but I'm like, well, I'm going to do it. And it worked. My brain still knew what to tell my body to do. And it's there, and we need to assure this that like, it's there if you can get out of your own way, which is the hardest part. Um, so since that's the hardest part, if the brain is tired, then it's not gonna be able to keep up with those demands. And that's where we see a lot of that fear creep in. I had a gymnast tell me, she was like, I, can, I only have good practices when the sun is out. <laughs> and I was like, okay, do you mean weekends? Like Saturday, Sunday practices are good for you? Said, yeah. I'm like, okay. Well, you didn't have school the day before. She was in high school taking a lot of like AP honors classes. Tires out your brain. By the end of the day, by 9.30 at night when you're still training, you're just, you're tired. You left for school at 6.30 this morning. You're tired. So instead of saying, giving it up to the world and saying, oh well, if the sun's not out, I'm gonna have a bad day. What if you have an evening meet? You know, what if you have something like that? And, and just letting the whole week pass you by, putting control back to her and saying, you're tired. There's a reason that you, can, that you have better practices when the sun's out. You have more energy. So how can we get you more energy? How can we get you more mental energy? How can we conserve brain power? How can we recharge? How can we create better habits for you? that you're gonna be able to actually practice when the moon's out as well. So, another analogy that I give our girls a lot is that your brain is like your smartphone. So, um, on our smartphones, if we are, you know, 
if you're here and your phone's like on the table, you're not doing much with it, like the battery's gonna last a lot longer throughout the day. But if you're on your phone, you're switching back and forth between apps, you're emailing, you're calling, you're taking pictures and all of that, you start to go into the, the battery drains a lot faster. When you get into low power mode, you don't have access to certain features like maybe Bluetooth or your phone turns, the screen turns off faster, stuff like that. So there is a limited capacity to your phone. You can plug it back in, you can recharge it. So our brains work much the same way. Where if our girls are tiring out their brains, they're fighting back and forth with each other in their heads, negative to positive and kind of arguing back and forth. They're doing that app switching that tires out their brain a lot faster. Um, and when it gets to a point, they go into low power mode. Stuff isn't working quite as well. They're starting to become more fearful. Things are starting to feel weird. Things are starting to feel off. But if they drain that brain battery completely, it, it doesn't work. It goes black. And a lot of gymnasts have described that to me where they're like, I just go blank. Like I black out. I don't, like there's no part of me that could do this skill right now. And they've exhausted everything. So if we can't figure out how to charge back up in that moment or prevent them from getting to zero in the first place, then we're gonna be in trouble. Um, they, they feel like they've forgotten everything they knew. Like I said, they've started to make silly mistakes. Um, or I've had girls who's like, you know, I did like five double backs and then I couldn't do it. Like I couldn't do it anymore. And I'm like, it was stressing you out. It was, you were worried about this skill. I'm glad you got in five reps. It means you can do this, let's not push it. Let's back off, let's walk away for the day. You can come back tomorrow and start working on them again. Um, Cause like I said, we, we don't give our brain enough credit. We kind of just count on it being there for us, doing all of these things. Um, but like I said, when it runs low, it's not gonna do a lot of this stuff. It's gonna give up on us. Um, and it, it's one of those um, self-preservation things that if the brain's saying, I don't have the power right now to get you safely through this skill or this tumbling pass or this routine, it's gonna say, we're not doing it. This isn't safe. And it's gonna start to try to convince you that this is scarier than it actually is. Because we're not asking girls off the street to come in and, and throw a Yurchenko. No, they've gone through the progressions. They've been doing this since they were in Mommy and Me. Like they, th their risk assessment starts to get skewed when their brain's tired. So what drains that? Like I said, the overthinking, kind of that spiraling, going down the path, you know, far, that fear, those nerves, um, battling with themselves, but even stuff like adrenaline. Sometimes athletes can, you know, they'll be like, well, I'm gonna get really pumped before practice tonight, I'm gonna do it. And I'm like, well, be careful. You don't wanna get, you know, that adrenaline, that getting sight, it takes a lot of energy. So don't burn yourself out before you get there. Um, even academics, all of the personal drama that can go on, you know, if kids are fighting with their friends or there's, you know, boyfriend issues or there's family stuff going on. That stuff is taxing. That stuff is stressful. That stuff is that they're thinking about all day and definitely cause that drain. So there's a bunch of ways to recharge. And it's something, you know, we kind of dive into and brainstorm with the girls and figure out what's gonna work for them. Um, but even stuff as simple as like having fun, <laughs> like talking with their teammates, listening to, watching like a funny YouTube video on the way to practice. Um, my teammates that I carpooled with, we would pay, play cards on the way to practice, every single practice. And it was such a great way to be like, school's over, we're headed to practice, but we're not thinking about either of them right now. We can't do anything about either of them right now. So, um, so take that time, do something fun, tune out, have fun with your friends, enjoy it. Um, taking a moment away from the action, you know, even bring some of that levity to it that like it's gymnastics. That at the end of the day, you have a horrible practice that most kids, I'm sure there's parents out there, but for the most part, you're going home, you're going home to your house, you're going home to a meal, you're gonna wake up, everything's gonna be fine. At the end of the day, you know, this is not life or death situation. Um, to be able to conserve mental energy, there's, we really wanna simplify as much as possible. So a lot of these things, it's, you know, these are the big concepts. 
right? But to do that is a lot harder than just saying it. So I can be like, well, when you're at school, like, just worry about school. <laughs> well, they're sitting there, their teacher's droning on about something, and they're worried about that they're going to be balking their flights at, at practice tonight. And they're already starting to stress about it. And they're sitting there, any downtime they have, that they're not focusing on what they could be doing in that moment. So I'll be like, all right, let's say, you know, you have a study hall. Instead of sitting there and wasting that precious time and spiraling and thinking about practice and worrying about practice, you know, do the homework or get ahead or read something or whatever, or do something that'll recharge you. If you genuinely don't have work that you need to be doing in that moment, take that time to do something fun for yourself. I don't know, doodle. What do you enjoy doing? Like, take those five minute breaks. I'm not saying that you need to go take a spa day to recharge. You don't have that luxury. I mean, these girls, the gymnasts that I work with, I mean, we struggle to fit in a half hour mindset call in a week. They are going, 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 going. So, how can we squeeze in meaningful things into those small chunks of time? Simplify, oh, and the flip side of that too, staying in the present moment. I mean, how often, I know for me, I'd be at practice worrying about, I have to do this report tonight. What if so-and-so sent, I was like AOL Instant Messenger at the time. What if I get, what's gonna be, you know, like waiting for me when I log back on my computer when I get home? Like all of that kind of stuff, when I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't write a report while I was on Beam. I couldn't do any of that. So really trying to bring yourself back to that present moment. And then simplifying as much as possible too. Um, you know, it's easy to get ahead of yourself and say, what do I, you know, if I don't do this or I have these many things to do, okay, what can you do right now? What in this moment, simplifying, you know, you're not on bars right now, you're on floor. So what should you be focusing on on floor? Really trying to simplify back to, to the basics. What do I need to do this turn? What do I need to do before the next turn? Um, and then really focusing only on yourself because I feel like it starts to get a little easier as adults, but for a lot of these kids, they're worrying about what everybody else is thinking, what everybody else is doing. They're constantly comparing every single one of their turns to what their teammates are doing. And too often, they're comparing, like maybe their teammate's phenomenal on bars and not so great on floor, but they're comparing their bars to their bars, even though their floor might be better. Like they're not seeing what they have to offer. They're looking outwards and seeing all of their flaws. They're worrying about what you as coaches are thinking, what their parents are thinking, what their teammates are thinking. So how can we help them? How can we really help them embody that focus on you piece of things. So something, and my presentation this afternoon is specifically on predator prey mindset stuff. So predator obviously has a bad reputation <laughs> um, as a word, but what we're talking about is like animal kingdom kind of stuff. So lions, tigers, bears, those kind of things, right? So predators have, predator animals have the, their eyes on the fronts of their heads. They do this, they're, they're focused on what they're going after. They don't have to worry about getting eaten, they're just worried about, on, worried about eating something. Um, so humans are natural born predators. Um, we have eyes in the front of our heads, we're not like chipmunks, squirrels, you know, all of those kind of things. We don't have eyes like where ears are, thank goodness. Um, because they need to be able to see all the way around and make sure nothing's coming after them. So for our kids, we compare it to that. And we keep reminding it's just an easy way to say, in a lot of situations, are you thinking like a predator? Are you worrying about you? Are you focused on what you want to achieve? Um, because we see this a lot in high level athletes. They're worried about what they're gonna do. They're worried about what they can control. They can control their effort. They can control their attitude. They can control how aggressive they are. They can't control the judges the equipment, their competitors. Um, we actually have a little bit of an advantage in gymnastics where there's not a defender at the end of the vault runway trying to block you from doing your suit, right? So we don't have to worry about that. Your gymnastics is your gymnastics. Like you have control over that directly. You don't have to go against an opponent. So what can you do to make a difference there? Let the rest fall to the side. 
Um, and like I kind of touched on, there are a lot of ways to think like a prey. It's a noisy place when you have those prey thoughts running through your head. But when you're thinking like a predator, it's like, what do I need to do right now? It's focused, it's simple, it's much narrower, it's much more specific. So, you know, for, for fear of mental blocks, um, those, those kind of squirrel thoughts, you know, they're, they're cycling through it. What if I make a dumb mistake? What if I get injured? What if I never get the skill back? What if my teammates start to doubt themselves too? What if I let my coach down? What if I have to stay late? You know, it's just kind of like we've been talking about. It's, it's spiral spirals. Or like those predator thoughts are, what do I need to do? Plain, simple, clear. Um, focus remaining. And it's hard to kind of explain to these athletes sometimes too that they'll be like, okay, I gotta really focus on this thing. Well, can you control that thing? If not, we don't wanna spend time on it. We don't wanna spend brain energy on that at all. Um, the other piece of, of this fear and these mental blocks is giving our gymnasts some control over this process. Because as much as we might want it for them, there's nothing we can do. We can't, we can threaten, we can praise, we can reward, we can offer all of these external things, but at the end of the day, the gymnast has to make the decision to do this. And you guys as skilled coaches are gonna be able to say, okay, this is your goal, that's where you wanna get, I can help you get there. I can't want it for you at any step of the way. So we want our gymnasts to take back that control. We also want them to feel confident that they can control their own thoughts. They've gotten into such a bad habit of saying, it's just the way I am. I just, it's, just, it's just how I do gymnastics. My teammates don't have these issues. It's just how I am. And they've accepted it. They've accepted that a part of them is not strong enough or they don't have the willpower or whatever. They just start to think that this is part of them. And what we wanna do is we wanna teach them how to understand their own brains a bit better, understand what makes them tick, what, what helps them, what hurts them, and, and go through that to give them back control. <laughs> like, don't just throw up your hands and say, well, if I go for it tonight, great. If not, oh well, that's just me. You know, we don't, we don't want that for them. Um, so a piece of that too, I want, I want the gymnasts to take some control for their training. So a lot of times they'll be like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do to practice tonight. Like my coach will give me an assignment. I'm like, great. And they have a reason behind those assignments. They're, they're working towards something. But what's your piece in this? What, when you go to practice tonight, you're just a vessel doing what you're told? Or are you going to go to bars and be like, okay, you have to do five bar routines. Is that it? Or are you going to work on, what do you want to work on tonight? Your form? Your landings on your dismounts? your you know, mindset before you get up on the bars. What do you wanna work on? What do you wanna work on? What's gonna get you further in this process? So working together to, to capitalize that on that. I think the other thing that gymnastics has taught is that the whole point is to point out every tiny little deduction that could exist there. At National Congress, they sat in on a level 10 judging session out of curiosity. Oh my goodness. One, the amount of stuff that these judges have to keep in their heads is just incredible. But two, to, to watch a video and hear them break down every tiny little thing, it's tough. And the girls start to see that and they start to say, you know, I, I have a lot of, I have a long way to go. I have a lot of weaknesses. I need to improve here, I need to improve there. And part of what we, what we do is say, what are you really great at? You know, maybe you have a chance to specialize in this a little bit more. If you can get a much higher score on this event, maybe you can be lacking a little bit over here. And it's not to say that you shouldn't train that event or you shouldn't work on those weaknesses, but how can we, whatever your, you know, your DNA, your genetic makeup, whatever you love, whatever you have a passion for, how can we capitalize on that as well? And giving them some control over that too. You know, if you're really, you, your technique is gorgeous, well, let's work with that. Let's minimize those deductions. Let's work through that. If you're really powerful, let's upgrade your difficulty. Um, so, you know, I'll have them like before each practice or when I talk to them, I'd be like, okay, what are you, what are you gonna work on at practice tonight? What's one thing that you wanna focus on tonight? Because too often we overthink it. We get too crazy. We think I have to do all of these. There's a lot going on in gymnastics. 
How can we simplify? What's one thing that's going to help you move forward? Um, we go through action plans, especially when seasons switch. So like competition season's over, we're switching to summer mode. What's an action plan? We go through a bunch of different areas of, you know, um, rest, recovery, sleep, um, flexibility, strength, nutrition, mindset, technique, progressions, like all of this kind of stuff. How can we really break this down? How can we be really purposeful about moving you forward? Um, and also, how can we be realistic with our expectations? So a lot of these girls are used to being like, okay, whatever you say, and I'll give a suggestion and be like, do you actually, do you think you have time to do that? And if they might be like, well, I don't know when, <laughs> but I could try. And I'm like, well, let's go through your schedule. What does your week look like? When are you on the bus? When are you in the car carpooling? When are you, you know, even things as simple as like getting a meal. You know, I can't tell you how many gymnasts are like, well, I grab like, you know, a granola bar on the way to practice or something. Like, what, how are we squeezing in all of these other pieces that are really important? So, like we talked about a little bit, those progressions are really, really important when it comes to fear and mental blocks. Same thing, Simone Biles Solutions, she's like, I went back to the pit. Pit, spot, whatever I needed to do to like get that back again. So making sure that we, we give our kids the space to work through those progressions again. And I get it, there's always a balance of like, we don't wanna go backwards and we don't wanna let them just live in the pit. And we want to push them and encourage them to put it somewhere else. But sometimes if, you know, um, my coach used to give the example of like, you know, he's like, you look like a fly at the window. Like you're just like trying to get out, doing the same thing over and over <laughs> again, right? And it's like, you know, don't be the fly. <laughs> like, Go find an open window, go find a door, go try something different. Um, so those power of progression is that you're gonna be able to do what feels comfortable again. So giving them the space to go back to the pit, to give them that spot, do whatever. Um, and, and encouraging them, my piece of it is, okay, what will you go for? If you won't go for a handspring layout on beam, will you go for a single back handspring? Will you do your handspring layout on floor? Will you do it on the low beam? Will you do it, like, where will you do it? And then once you're doing it there, I want you to notice what's going through your head when you're doing it there. So instead of, like, mindlessly doing 10 handspring layouts on the floor and, not, and then trying to go to high beam and starting to freak out, what can you focus on? What can you think about? What's running through your head when you're doing handspring layouts on floor? Like we said at the beginning, probably not much probably a pretty quiet place. So what can you focus on instead? What's your cue? So maybe your handspring, I mean, every time I did my flight, I did my hands like this. I grabbed my thumb, it was my thing. That was like, mentally, it was just like, okay, here we go, and I'm going. But I knew that. So what can you give your gymnast? What can they think about to have some purpose there? Again, wanting to, as they're doing the progressions, training for that feel. Because like we said, we don't know how we're doing these skills, like logically. Like we can't say, oh, I do this, this, and this, and I do, it's like, I don't know, I set and I pull my arms down. Fair enough. Then when you go to do that on, you know, the floor instead of in the pit, just think about that. You'll be good to go. But letting them train for that feel of things. What does it feel like? How can you trust the process? How can you prove to yourself and collect that evidence that you're like, well, I was doing double fulls onto max, actually eight inches higher than the pit, so there's no reason I can't put it on the floor. Those progressions allow for that a little bit. And um, we don't want to establish the bad habits because the balking or the standing still or just standing there not doing anything can really, really, I mean, we're, every time they balk, we were working with one girl who <laughs> nine times out of 10, she would run down the vault runway and run to the side. And I was glad that it wasn't, you know, like round off balk and like flying herself over the table or something. But every time she did that, she was solidifying a different mind-body connection. She was solidifying a different piece of muscle memory. It was super not helpful, right? Her brain was starting to train her body to run to the side. 
So instead of creating that rut, you know, the more we do something, we're creating these like brain ruts. Instead of letting them do that, what, what, how can we break through that? How can we minimize the balking so that they can, um, at least if nothing else, not be creating new bad habits? Um, like, like I said, our purposeful progressions are definitely better than balking. So let's back up. What will you do? And then we'll keep moving forward. Because if, they, if they've already learned it once, the process to getting that skill back should be fairly quick. If we give it the space, if we address it quick enough, and the more they work through this. So a lot of these kids, this is something they've been dealing with off and on for years. They're like, I'm just one of those gymnasts, right? But after we're able to get them that first breakthrough and teach them this process, it's not to say it's ever gonna come up again. I just had a girl recently, she's like, I'm not doing my Arabians. Okay, we did this already. Remember what worked last time? We have it written down, we have a plan, let's go through. And within the week, they were back. Instead of like months of avoiding the skill, crying about this skill, trying to learn other new skills. It was just we knew what to do. And they have the confidence that like I did this once, I'll be able to do it again. The other piece that I touched on as well is the ability to have fun in the gym. These are things that I hear from my girls a lot, um, especially a lot of my upper level kids that we work with is, you know, like, can you, when you're feeling frustrated, when you're feeling down, that's not helpful to you. Can you chat with your teammates? Can you crack a joke? Can you turn on some upbeat music? And she's like, nah, I have to look miserable. We're all getting yelled at, <laughs> right? I was there. I remember being there where I'm like, whew, I better look like I'm mad at myself and that I can't believe it and you know, whatever. Because I did, you know, on, on these gymnasts are frustrated with what's going on. They're not happy that they're not going for these things. Oftentimes they do want this. So, but giving that outward appearance and sulking and making it, playing it up even more to be like, you know, show their teammates and their coach how much they care, it's, it's not helping them. It's so counterproductive. Um, the other thing is like, I have to stand there in that corner, you know, and pretend like I'm gonna go wipe my hands 50 billion times and, you know, act and false start. I have to pretend like I'm gonna do it. Even though they'll say to me, and I say, if you're standing in the corner, do you know whether you're gonna go or not? And they're like, oh yeah, I'm not doing it. <laughs> but I'll act like I'm going to. So what if you can give your gymnast an out and say, instead of standing there wasting a half hour of everybody's time, what will you do? What can you do with purpose today to make that half hour worthwhile? Um, or even giving them the space. Sometimes they do just seem to walk away, get a drink, regroup. Act like it's not a big, as big of a deal because ultimately it's one skill in one sport, in one small part of their life. So we don't need to make this a bigger deal than it needs to be. And these kids are very good at making things a bigger deal than they need to be, right? <laughs> We've seen it. That little things can turn into massive things. So we don't need to contribute to that. Let's try to bring some levity to that. Because um, like I said, it, it starts that negative spiral. And if you have one girl sulking and angry and upset, and it drags the rest of the environment down. If we can keep a little bit more upbeat, a little bit more positive, um, and encouraging our girls to be like, I know you're struggling with this right now, but I need you to be a leader and not take everyone else down with you. Taking it from that perspective, it's amazing how giving them that responsibility can help them step up and actually improve themselves as well. Um, so it's hard, we can't just wait for it to happen. And I know for you guys, it's more fun. Those practices are more fun. When your girls are happier, more upbeat, you know, maybe the sun's out. <laughs> like, it's a little bit more enjoyable to be at practice. And you guys are there all the time. I don't know, like, this is why I did not ever get into team coaching. Not for me. I don't want to give up every evening, every weekend, all of that. So I commend you guys for that. It's a lot. But I want you to enjoy it while you're there too. Doesn't have to be miserable for you either. So like I said, at the end of the day, it's supposed to be fun, right? Um, the other 
key piece of this, and we'll see how we're doing on time here, um, is that we do want to lay that foundation. So with our mindset sessions, a lot of times I'll spend that first part of the session say, what's been going on? How's your last week been? What's been going on at practice? And we'll, we'll troubleshoot some of those things especially when it's like balking and stuff like that and they're coming to us and they're like, you know, wave your magic wand and help me throw my Yurchenkos again, right? We'll work through that, we'll troubleshoot that. But that's gonna come up time and time again if we're not addressing some of this other stuff, if we're not laying that foundation. So I try to partner it. Let's troubleshoot, let's brainstorm, let's figure out stuff and then let's go to the basics. Those mindset foundations, those mindset handstands you know, what can we rely on when stuff gets tough again? Because a lot of times, the fear and mental blocks is coming from that lack of confidence. Maybe they're self-sabotaging. That was a big one for me, which I did not even realize until I started working with this program, <laughs> kind of reflecting back on my own gymnastics, how often I got really close to something amazing and pulled myself back. So how can we address that? Why are you self-sabotaging? Is there a lack of self-knowledge there? What does make you tick? What does work for you? Some gymnasts do really well when the pressure's on or the energy level's really high, and other girls need it to feel like their practice. You know, they just want it to be calm. They need to be calm. And it's not one size fits all. So how can we figure that out? What's gonna work for you? How are you gonna be able to cope with nerves? So that when you get stressed out or you know, some, there's a new skill coming up or summer's coming up, you know, how, can we, how can we work through that? That lack of focus, you know, those struggles. Um, there's a lot of areas that then can contribute to the fear and mental blocks. So we wanna partner the two. So quick, real quick, I'll go over the program options and then we'll open up to q and I'm happy to answer any questions. I also, I don't have to run, to, I don't have another presentation until this afternoon. So if you guys want to ask questions out there while well, the next person gets started, I can stick around as well. Um, so like I said, we have, we have an individual and team program. So individual, each gymnast gets paired up with their own mindset coach. They do one-on-one -on -one sessions where it says it's kind of a little bit of troubleshooting, mentoring, um, and then working through that curriculum together. Um, and then team packages as well, we can do them in person. If we have someone close to you, we can do Skype stuff, and we can, we can bundle those team workshops in a variety of ways based on what you guys need, what you're looking to do. Um, you know, sometimes over the summer we'll do them, or it's like right before season, we need another one, we need to focus on relaxing under pressure. We can cater that for you and your team. And we do offer those free mindset sessions um, for those initial calls. So if you have girls that you feel like should at least try this or see what's going on, um, you can have their parents reach out to me directly. You have my card. Um, there's a form on the website as well, right at the very top, like schedule a free mindset session or something like that. You can always refer them to that. Um, and I'm happy to chat with them there. And here's all my other information if you wanna Take a picture of it, take it with you. Um, but thank you guys for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what questions do you guys have? Yes.